I'm Jacob Purifoy, and I'm a freshman biology major from Ashdown, Arkansas. I actually have a huge passion for history as well, and so I'm really fortunate to be able to go on my very first honor study abroad opportunity for the Camino de Santiago trek through France and Spain. I grew up Catholic, so I've known about the Camino for a while, and I knew it from more of the spiritual side and how it's just this pilgrimage that you take to the tomb of St. James, and it's the renewing and refreshing of your spiritual life. Well, I kind of like the idea of study abroad that moves. I just feel like, you know, classes are great in Fayetteville, and I teach them, they're fun, but there will be nothing more transformative than actually being on site. For me, the thing I look forward to the most on the trip is probably just finally getting to my monument and seeing it for myself. You know, I've studied up on it, read up on it so much. This is my jewel that I'm going to present. And just be able to, you know, lay my hand across it and touch it and all its splendor that it's endured. And Pilgrims! Woo! Are you all ready to go on the Camino de Santiago? And we are traveling along the medieval route to venerate the relics of the Apostle James. Starting from Paris, heading down to Toulouse, and then shooting across Spain through Jaca, Burgos, Leon, and ending up in the fabulous magisterial Santiago de Compostelo. In the Middle Ages, your pilgrimage started when you stepped outside your front door. Our honors passport pilgrimage involved 15 hours in planes and airports, and we got started walking with the forced march tour of medieval Paris. The next day, we were all pretty jet lagged. To be honest, Paris was a bit of a blur. We went to the church of Saint Denis, a Christian martyr who is the patron saint of France. Saints' relics and royal burials are a big draw for pilgrims on the Camino de Santiago. We are at the Louvre, in front of the famous pyramid, characteristic of Paris that everybody comes to see. And we're not actually going inside, but um, we are just enjoying the, trying to stay dry. It's been an amazing day. We've gotten to see Saint Denis, uh, Notre Dame, and Saint Chapelle. And I think Saint Chapelle is my favorite. The stained glass in the upper register was just amazing. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. My feet hurt, but I'm glad to be here. So not, why, why not complaining. We've been walking around all day, so I'm looking forward to sitting down at dinner and going to sleep tonight. But I'm. I'm, I'm sticking it out. I'm, it's going to be worth it to see all the things. Welcome to Alce Camp Cemetery. It's a very, as you said, a sort of eerie place to walk through, a place that many artists, including Van Gogh, have come to to paint, especially the entryway that we just processed down. It started in the Roman period, uh, and from then it was used by Christians because many martyrs were buried here. I think this is too straight. Right now we're just going around looking at all the tombs and exploring. It's kind of odd because you come in and it looks so dead, you know, and it's, it, you, you can see what it was definitely because you can see the architecture and the narrow walkway lined with the tombs and the trees up over above, but it's all destroyed. It's all dead. It's just, it's very much, it's a cemetery of a culture almost. This is a very special place. 
It was, outside of Rome, considered to be one of the greatest funerary sites in the western part of the Roman Empire. But also, the, the history of the Christian church at Arles is the history of several pretty spectacular martyrdoms. And in late antiquity, Christians wanted to be buried next to the martyrs. So to be near the martyrs is to have a glimpse into paradise. Before we left, we had to check out the acoustics in the chapel. We didn't have our instruments, so we sang instead. Pretty amazing to sing in the City of the Dead. We had a spectacular <laughs> a cappella moment with music that was composed for the pilgrims going on the Camino. And I told the students later that the dead in the area, who my view is the, the space is massively haunted in a good way, that the dead hadn't heard that music in 800 years. Today, we're in Conk, way off the beaten path in southwest France. Home to 90 people, a herd of goats, and more than one million visitors a year. Most of them, pilgrims on the Camino. A beautiful church, an unruly saint, and a spectacular reliquary with St. Foy's school inside of it have put this little village on the Camino map. Tenley, this is a really wonderful example of why medieval pilgrims were so invested in relics and reliquaries. But for a medieval pilgrim, this was a place right here with this reliquary that united the heavens and the earth. Yeah. Why through the body of the saint held within. So saints leave behind pieces of their body which becomes this axis mundi with the other world. I found it really interesting because you can see her head is very manly, and that's because it's not a head of a female, it's a head of a Roman emperor. Um, and she, of course, wears the crown because she was the, the monarch of the town, you know? She, you couldn't get anything <laughs> past her. You couldn't, like, laugh at her. She'd kick you into the dust, which happened multiple times. And the stories that would pass down the Camino Trail, St. Foy in Conque, France, and I'm about to present on this portal in the tympanum over the door. That when they kind of shifted from having like a text over the door to having like images over the door in the 12th century, you don't have room for like a frieze that's like a running narrative, so you have to pick like one thing that's very important. So obviously the Last Judgment, kind of summation of the whole Christian story. The priest encouraged us to experience the Camino. And that night, we surely did, when we were invited to perform in the church after the pilgrims were blessed. None of us will forget Kong. It's so picturesque. It's easy to see why pilgrims go out of their way to visit here. So today's my turn to present on the Chateau de Puileron. 
It was one of many castles in southern France that sheltered Cathar heretics. The Cathars had some different views on religion, so the Pope called for a crusade against them, and the King of France sent down armies from the north. This was definitely a hotbed of action in the 12th and 13th centuries. This castle was completed in 1160, and it took at least five or so years to build it by the King of Aragon. It's changed hands many times. This region has a complicated history, but we'll get into that. Puylaren is almost a thousand years old. And to think, the trees are just now breaching the castle. That's most obviously a slit for arrows. I'd feel bad for anybody who climbs all the way up this mountain just to get punctured by an arrow ruin at the top. So being a soldier here was a very uh, gruesome livelihood. Uh, there was always food rationings, poor sanitation, uh, always the fears of the armies of the north coming down to stamp out the heresy. Fortunately, we're here in the 21st century, so we got to enjoy a traditional Sunday lunch after visiting the castle. It was one of our favorite meals on the trip. It feels very exciting. Finally, actually, when I get to walk, very exciting. The Pyrenees, they are beautiful. There's actually some snow, so I'm excited about that since we didn't get any snow in Arkansas last year. I'm super pumped. I love hiking and I love the mountains, and these are the most beautiful mountains I have ever seen here in the Pyrenees. So I am so, so excited. I am really glad we have a guide, though, just because I am a little bit clumsy. But we'll see how that goes. We're hiking the Camino de Santiago. We are in the Pyrenees Mountains crossing from France into Spain. Look out, Linda, you're about to be taken over by the Count of Toulouse. Oh Here he comes. Curtis, your body's gonna hate you later. My body already hates me. Understandable. Up the hill. I've never felt more alive and in the elements of the Camino de Santiago. This is the Count of Toulouse. <laughs> proudly, proudly displaying his banner. We're leading on our journey. We're leading, I'm leading my people into a new land. We're gonna set up a government that allows for all Cathars. <laughs> Muslims and Christians, we're gonna live in peace. It's gonna be wonderful. No matter rain or snow, we're onwards on the Camino. Forwards and upwards, my friends. We are on top of the Les Samport. It's a peak in the Pyrenees Mountains, very high. Uh, as you can see around us, it's uh, we got some you know lovely weather going. Just a the perfect stuff for a hike. It's just really it's it's great. It's fantastic. I was really excited to do this because um, I have cerebral palsy. It's a musculoskeletal condition that affects my stamina and endurance and strength among other things. So doing high adventure stuff like this is my kind of way of saying that doesn't matter. And uh, I always hope that like anyone watching stuff like this or seeing in these kind of videos or seeing people like me do these kind of things, it motivates you to do something that you didn't think was possible before because that's really kind of guided my whole life. And so doing this, this was easy. You can always gain something from doing something that you didn't think you could do. And even if you fail at it, as I have before, it's always a learning experience. In France, it was mostly about the men. Kings 
and Cathar Knights, and the Count of Toulouse. In Spain, we visited sites where women held real power. We are at Santa Maria La Real de las Huelgas, which is a convent that was built in the early 12th century. It was founded by King Alphonse VIII and his wife, um, Eleanor of England. Every abbess up until the 15th century, 16th century, was part of the royal family. So her daughters and granddaughters ruled this convent. So this site is very important because it highlights a uh, queenship and um, royal abbesses of the medieval era and how much power they truly held in um, this region of Spain. They controlled 14 large cities and 15 smaller cities in the surrounding areas, which was monumental for the time, especially for women. It turns out it was a saint, not her sight, that had really reached Darcy. Um, so we were just in San Pedro in Jaca, Spain. I thought we were just going into another church, which sounds awful, but we've been in a lot this week, um, and I just was wandering around, and then I saw a sculpture um, of a young woman with a platter of eyeballs extended and my heart immediately bursted. Um, that is St. Lucy, which is my confirmation saint. Um, I am Catholic and when you get confirmed you choose a saint to take on their name and their story um, and you're supposed to meet with them when you get to heaven and you're supposed to pray with them and ask them to intercede for you and ask them to help you out. And so she's been a part of my life for seven years now um, and I've never seen, sorry I'm tearing up again, um, I've never seen a statue, I've never seen a relic of her um, because she's not super popular as a saint but um, she holds a lot of meaning to me. Between visits to some pretty amazing churches and museums, we got to try some Spanish tapas. city of Leon in Spain and we're sitting outside of the former Roman walls and you can see a round tower behind me that has some Roman remains in it and we've come here to see not only the cathedral which is a beautiful example of Parisian Gothic in Spain. So this is a city that had a flourishing period during the Romanesque and pilgrimage period and then because it's part of the kingdom of Castile and Leon, it's kind of a royal city. So it really combines all the things that we've seen so far, starting in Paris, along the, then along the pilgrimage trail to Santiago. I like the fact that this cathedral is uh, similar to previous ones we've seen, and the themes on the portals are quite similar as well. So the way there's a layered approach to this um, portal, I like that and it's a bit more detailed than previous ones I've seen. I also like the fact that there's more depth. It's not as flat as um, previous ones we've seen, like for instance, saint Poix. You could read it, but it was not as detailed as what you would find here. I'm very much coming up with a new perspective. I'm starting to understand structure a bit more. It's very eye-opening to me to see how um, people use precedents, which we're encouraged now to use in architecture school to continue and make better. Today, we've reached the end of the road, the destination of all pilgrims on the Camino, the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. St. James is buried here, and pilgrims gather to pray and a party. <laughs> Like everybody else, we got our group shot, and then we checked out the cathedral. 
It's a tradition for pilgrims to hug the sculpture of St. James, which is above his tomb. The St. James that is in, here in Santiago de Compostela is James the Great, the son of Zebedee and Salome, and he was the first disciple to be martyrized. There's a couple of theories how St. James came to this very remote part of the world at the time. The first one is that angels took his body from Jerusalem and transported it to the land of Galicia, which, which is where we are right now. And the other one is that his two disciples brought his body by sea on a boat and it landed on the, on the shores of Finisterra, which was considered the end of the world then in Roman medieval times. The next day, we headed to Finisterre, the end of the world and the end of our journey. It was our last chance to get off the bus, get our feet wet, hike a bit, and reflect on the experience. We kind of cheated, where we skipped over some parts and we just saw the nice bits of the Camino but that's not really what life is, right? So I think that if I were to do the Camino again, for one, I definitely have to do the difficult parts in order to make the good parts so much of more of a reward. I would say just how, how the smallest things can mean so much. In Notre Dame, uh, there was a small room off to the side that all I had was a, a statue of Mary, a very small statue of Mary, two rows of seats, it was probably 10 by six, and, and there was candles. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not Catholic and I'm not particularly religious, but I went in there and I sat down and I, I just sat there. For whatever reason, that was like one of the most special moments, you know? Between childhood and adulthood, you're kind of, it's kind of ambiguous, you kind of don't know if you're a child or an adult. It's just kind of, this, this ambiguous, ambiguous area. Pilgrimage in the past and pilgrimage today are the same in that uh, in both cases they are kind of liminal, kind of betwixt and between as a rite of passage. Between here and there you, you have this experience, the spiritual experience, uh, where you become a new self once uh, you get there. The act of walking kind of turns material into immaterial and the, the earth as you're going by turns into immaterial. A pilgrim summed it up well saying that you don't walk over the earth, that the earth walks over you. And it kind of, you kind of just feel this, um, that your body is like the nexus between the heavens and the earth and also between um, the self and the environment. And that transcendent experience is very spiritual, obviously. I think my biggest takeaway from uh, the Honors Passport pilgrimage as a whole has really been to um, really kind of garner that respect for everyone, no matter what they do, no matter what they study, and just venture into something that you may not be prepared for. Like, even if it's not your number one thing, if it's not your major in college, if it's not your career path, just being able to go in and say, hey, I'm gonna do this and tackle this just because it's a challenge. <laughs> Come on.